Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Um, so, ChatGPT, big sensation, right? Um, ever since the release of ChatGPT in November 2022, um, our industry has been going through this explosive growth in you know, investment, excitement, in generative AI. And the biggest debate last year was about open versus close. Which one has enough performance and feature functionalities to meet the enterprise needs? And which one has more community support and adoption? And ever since we had, so it's been a race. You know, every day I turn on my phone, oh, there's a new model, bigger, faster. And last, um, until recently, a couple months ago, Meta released a Llama 3.1, 4145B, and it's pretty exciting, it's pretty safe to say the performance of open source model is catching up with the proprietary models out there. And from community support standpoint, Hugging Face has got more than a million open models and data sets released. So it's pretty safe to say open source AI is here to stay. Okay, but moving uh, forward, you know, we need to tackle the practicality, right? How are we gonna make it happen? My name is Annie Lai. I'm currently the chair of Generative AI Commons. I'm gonna use the next few minutes to talk about Generative AI Commons and um, MOF, you heard from Gabriel this morning. And MOF is our number one highest value output from this community, and I'm gonna go through that with you today. So uh, this is not, going. <laughs> yeah, so, China, oh, China? Oh, okay. Okay, stop, all right. So, Generative AI Commons, we were launched about this time last year. Within a year, we have achieved quite a bit of momentum. We have over 200 active members from 80 plus organizations. My, um, the vice chair, um, Arnaud, I don't know if he's here. He's based in, you know, in here, Europe. And um, we have um, Wiki, uh, Wikimedia Deutschland, who is also a member, and um, uh, cloud geometry is also a company based in Berlin. They are participating in it, but still not enough. I like to invite all of you to check out Generative AI Commons and um, increase the representation of the European community. And it is created with the vision of advancing the innovation of uh, generative AI via open source and via um, open science. It is an open membership. That means you don't have to belong to um, a company that's part of a Linux Foundation or LFA Europe. Anybody in the world is welcome. And because we think that, you know, the, the AI community is slightly different from the traditional open source community. Traditional open source communities, you have the developers. And, but when we're talking about open source AI, then we need to include the data scientists, maybe even psychologists, social scientists, policy makers. So the composition of community would, should evolve. So that's why we decided to start this um, group called Generative AI Commons. We call it Commons instead of Committee is because, again, it's an open membership. Anybody is welcome to participate, contribute, or just to learn. If you are brand new to AI, it's a really good place for you to dial in and during our calls. And you know, every we have our biweekly calls, and at every call we invite guest speakers from the industry to talk about their latest work in Gen AI. It is a platform to build thought leadership. So if you have any idea in Gen AI, please come to our forum and you can present your ideas to our community. It is also a platform to uh, incubate your open source projects in Gen AI. And currently we have four work streams. The first work stream is called MAD. <laughs> it doesn't mean people are mad <laughs> in this work stream. It stands for Models Application Data. So this work stream, we work on open source projects in the model application data space. And we are currently building landscape. And after that, we're gonna build reference architectures, best practice in that, in that area. And um, while we're moving fast, 
We also want to be conscientious about being responsible when we build AI. So we have another work stream called Responsible AI. In this work stream, we're currently defining responsible AI. We understand a lot of companies have a definition of responsible AI, but we think as an open source community, we should have a, a definition that we all agree on. And with that agreed on definition and framework, we can work together on projects in the responsible AI space. And currently, this group is working on um, a responsible AI framework. Um, it's very interesting. Please join us. And then the third work stream is outreach and education. This is where we, you can get a ton of learning materials, blogs, webinars. Uh, I host quarterly webinars. Um, the first one was the importance of openness in Gen AI. Um, the second one we just had it uh, last week is the uh, the role of data in Gen AI. Very interesting. I invite like the industry luminaries, experts in this space, and oh, the webinars are recorded. So go to genaicommons.org website. It has all of the work that uh, we have done. And um, last but not least, the framework work stream is where we are developing MOF model openness framework and model openness tool. And I'm going to talk about what that means, what they are. So in the importance of openness in Gen AI, like I said, the debate is over. Open source models is going to stay. This definitely benefits to support open source. You know, like the traditional open source software, it can help us with the speed of innovation, collaboration, transparency, and um, you know, accelerate learning and adoption. And in addition to those benefits, um, open source AI can help us with managing bias and building more ethical AI and um, build trust between the AI producers and AI users. And um, hopefully we can lay the, you know, uh, lay out the uh, work, lay work for policymakers when they consider building, uh, you know, creating regulatory requirements for AI. Okay, next one. So you heard about open washing this morning from Gabriel, right? So obviously the word open is a you know favorite word for a lot of people, uh, even though they don't. Sometimes they don't understand what openness means, or sometimes they deliberately confuse their audience with the word open or openness. So to combat that, um, we came up with MOF. So uh, okay, let me go back to. What does that mean, open washing? So a lot of model producers are saying, yeah, uh, my model is open. But if you look at their licenses, either they don't have sufficient licenses to prove that they are truly open, or the licenses are not uh, what our community, open source community, consider legit, right? And our community, we only recognize OSI approved licenses. So, so with that, um, so um, at the beginning of the year, this group of people, um, researchers, actually, Kaylin is here, represent Oxford. Yeah, he's one of the authors of the original authors of this paper. And we also have a professor, Liu, from Columbia University. And um, his team, his research assistants helping out. And then we have a, a few more people from Generative AI Commons, you know, co authored this paper. It's a thought leadership paper. And with that paper, we're working on a spec, you know, which is will be officially approved by open um, uh, generative AI Commons community. So this paper has gone through many, many reviews, public reviews, and also we have invited um, model producers and model users and talked to them about this paper. So the, so far, we've gotten a lot of good feedback. And everybody said, it's hard work. I can't believe it. you guys are doing it. It's great. You're doing it, but it's hard. <laughs> so I just wanted to give you that insight. Um, so what we did was we kind of opened up the model producing life cycle. We have identified 17 components of the model life cycle. And from a code standpoint, there's an evaluation code, processing code, model architecture, library tools, training code, inference code. From a data perspective, obviously data is very important. And um, some people say data is the new code in AI, right? Because data can be a biggest differentiator and show the, the quality of your model. And so this data sets, evaluation data, sample model outputs, mod, uh, model weights, parameters, model metadata, configuration file. And then documentation is also very important, like model card data. 
and technical report evaluation results research paper and data card. So we looked at the 17 components. So number one, we look for the availability of the license of each component and we want to see what kind of license they use for each component. And so in general, like I said, we will only recognize OSI approved license for any source code. For any structured data, we would only recognize uh, CDLA, uh, which is Linux Foundation's community data uh, license. And for non-structured content, such as documents, we, rec we only rec um, recognize CCBY. The, uh, so I know there's a lot of debate about this. Again, this is in works, and it sets a pretty good you know, foundation we're in the process of refining it, but, um, but it sets the you know, stage that it gives the model producer an opportunity to be totally transparent. It gives the model users an opportunity to see exactly what they're getting. So this is our way of combating open washing. So with that information, we categorize the model into three classes. Uh, class three, which is the basic uh, class, we call it open model. So that includes you know, the openness of model architecture, parameters, technical report evaluation results, model card, data card, and um, some sample model outputs. And um, the next level is uh, class three plus training code, inference code, evaluation code, evaluation data, supporting libraries. And the highest level, which we think is the true open science based on true open science definition. That means everything's open, including data, research papers. So we're not saying which one is right or wrong or which one is you know, the ideal open, but what we're saying is we're giving the gradient you know, level of openness that your model can represent. And so it's you know, in total transparency, from, we talked to a lot of model producers, it's not very common to see models that qualify as class one, except for those academia or you know, open research models. But model three, uh, class three is pretty you know, achievable. Class two, a lot of times companies want to use the, the, like the training code, inference code as differentiator or as, or as where they can make money, right? Uh, so it really depends on the use case. So that's what we're saying is, Again, it's about being transparent about how open your model is. And um, in order to accomplish that, we created this tool called Model Openness Tool. If you go to the website, is it open.ai, you'll see this is a place where model producers can go there, disclose their license information, and it's just like Wikipedia. It's self-disclosure, and but we're using the community to double check, triple check what you put in, right? If people lied about it, then it's, people are definitely gonna you know, criticize your information here. And um, so this is where they put people, the model producers put down the license information of the 17 components, and then, and then eventually the tool will generate which class your model belongs. So check it out, it's pretty interesting. We are currently working on getting a sandbox at Hugging Face, because we think that if Hugging Face community can truly support this, then this tool will become a true de facto standard. So um, yeah, come join Generative AI Commons. So with that, I'm gonna transition the stage to Stefano, who is gonna talk about open source AI definition. Thanks, Annie. So we've been doing, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I'll skim through, uh, you, you probably already know that the Open Source Initiative has been doing this research and trying to identify what really open source means, how to transfer the principles of open source, what we have had as the driver of open innovation and collaboration. The Open Source Initiative is the, author the authority that has been defining, maintaining the open source definition for software for 26 years, and we wanna do the same thing for for, um, uh, for, or for AI. So we, in, we knew from the very beginning that we were not gonna be able to just come out of the cave with, with a sacred text that everyone would, would agree on, and we needed to bring together the existing uh, stakeholders uh, to, to understand exactly how 
we take the, uh, the principles of open source into this new domain. So we, we uh, um, started this process with uh, co-designing, which is a set of creative methodologies for, to design something together with the stakeholders, not for them. And uh, we asked them questions. So the first question has been, to accelerate the process, we basically said, what can we take from the old texts, like the GNU Manifesto, what, from, the, from the, what the definition of free software, which is the precursor to open source software, or, yeah. Um, so we said, what, 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 can we, what can we take them? And we started asking questions to people. We went to, into, around the world, started, starting towards the end of the third quarter last year, and um, in, in the United States, in Africa, and ask them, what, what do you need? What do you think, what do you need in order to distribute, study, uh, use, and, and, and uh, modify uh, software? What are those principles? And we came up with the four freedoms, basically. It was not too complicated to say that, oh, sorry, uh, that the, the four freedoms that apply to software can also be ported to, uh, to AI. So, uh, we rewrote with the community the principles, slightly adapting with the, to the text. But then the next question was, how do you study and how do you modify uh, an AI system? And, um, and that's what we asked. So what components do you need? This is where, uh, coincidentally, at the same time, the model openness framework was being drafted. So we leaned on each other's shoulder. We asked. Um, at workshops online this time, a bunch of uh, the, um, experts from different parts of the world, uh, a lot of diversity in here, 50% of participants are people of color, 25% um, are, are women and non-binary, et cetera, from different parts of the world. We asked them to analyze four existing um, large language models and computer vision neural networks to uh, to ask them, asking them what you need in order to modify, um, study, especially to modify and study, and which components do you need. And they voted on them, and uh, we released, based on these requirements of what they expressed, uh, we released a new draft of the, of the definition. And the basically iterated on top of that, we asked them also to validate whether the definition was working correctly, and we ended up with this three pieces, right? We, we need open weights, parameters, uh, we need code used to train and run the system, and we need the data set. So what about the data set? Um, what about the data set? So the weights, the code, um, you, you need, we need, we, we, we understood from the uh, feedback of the experts that we, uh, that worked with us, of the working groups, that we need to know how the the, the systems have been trained. And, and then on the data front, we hit a little bit of a wall because data is not, the, is not easy to distribute. A lot of laws, especially when you start assembling large data sets, a lot of laws get in the way, like from privacy law, copyright law, and other laws, uh, don't make it possible for, for developers or data scientists to distribute freely those data sets safely around the world. And, and so we ended up with um, describing a, a workaround, saying, okay, so you can't distribute the data set, but you can tell me exactly how you built it. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. We're, gonna, we're requiring sufficiently detailed information about the data and, and the tools that you'd use in order to cr uh, cr crawl the web, <laughs> filter it, ablate it, they duplicate it, tokenize it, et cetera. All those elements need to be made available. And uh, um, recognizing that we have all these challenges in the, in the training data. So we're gonna end this process. Uh, we're aiming to having a version 1.0 stable release at the end of October. And we want the, uh, the principles that the, the board has asked us to provide them for, for approval is that the Definition has a wide range of support from a variety of stakeholders, not just big corporations, small corporations, not Europeans. Not, it needs to be a very wide, gigantic support globally uh, with different interest groups. It needs to provide examples of something that actually exists that we can point at as an open source AI that does something. It's not just a theoretical 
description of a toy, a demo running in a, in a university department. And we must have something workable by the end of October. This conversation has been going around for us for more than two years, and it doesn't seem like it's getting any easier to, uh, to, define, to find the definition. So we need to plant a stake in a pure software fashion, say this is 1.0, we will fix it later as we go. We need to put it into action and see if it performs. What we're still accepting comments and it's, we're, still, we're still in the drafting phase, if you want. So uh, you can comment on the public forums. You can talk to me, of course. You can join our weekly town halls. We're going to have one on Friday afternoon, 5 p.m. Um, and next week, it's going to be at 9 a.m. European time. So we're trying to cover in, with these town halls, time zones uh, in Asia and the uh, and United States, Pacific in areas. And, um, and of course, we are always open. We are a nonprofit, uh, 501c3 charity organization. We're always open for donations from individuals and from corporations. Like a little pitch, uh, we need more European companies because we are uh, uh, n logos. We don't need a lot of money. We just need the logos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this is my summary. I try, try to stay within time, I hope. Thank you.